Welcome back to Rockstock Channel. It is Wednesday, April 10th, 11 in the morning. Uh, over the past two years, Lithium Rush, the RK Equity scoreboard, has grown from some 50 companies to now over 150. And it's been very hard for Rodney and I to keep up with all the new listings you know, that came about in 2022 and 2023. But as the dust settles in Lithium Equity land over the course of this year, we've been spending some time in the first quarter reaching out and getting to know a number of these new stories and picking some we think you might also like to get to know. Next up is Surge Battery Metals, presented by its chairman, Graham Harris. I've known Graham since around 2016 when he was chairman of and RK Equity was a strategic advisor to Millennial Lithium. Millennial developed the Pastos Grandes Brine Project in Argentina to definitive feasibility study and was then acquired by Lithium Americas for over $400 million, up from inception, which was about $25 million. So Graham's created substantial shareholder value through that endeavor. And in that experience, I got to know millennial technical advisors, VJ Mehta and Ian Scar, who are also technical advisors to Surge, and Graham, no doubt, will be talking about today. But to be clear, Rodney and I are not currently strategic advisors to, nor invested in, surge battery metals. And of course, we are not financial advisors and nothing in this video should be considered investment advice. Please do your own research and read the disclaimer at the end of this video. Note that a written summary of this interview will be published in the next edition of RK Equity's Lithium Ion Bull. Please register your email at rkequity.com if you would like to receive this newsletter directly to your email box. And please make sure to like this video, subscribe to Rockstock channel, and leave a question or comment below. What do you think of Graham and Surge Battery Metals prospects? What other companies might you be interested to hear from on this channel? As always, I'll begin each Getting to Know You episode with a summary synopsis of some key company attributes. Looking at the RK Equity scoreboard, Surge Battery Metals trades on the Toronto Venture Exchange, ticker symbol NILI, as well as the United States over-the-counter market ticker symbol NILIF. Surge has a market cap of about 69 million Canadian or about 52 million US dollars. They are developing a sedimentary project in Nevada. Their current cash balance is five and a half million Canadian following their most recent raise of 70 million last May, which was led by strategic investment from American Lithium, who is their biggest shareholder at 9%. For a small company, Surge already has substantial analyst coverage. Sprott has a target price of $3 and Roth Capital has a $2.5 target price. And Cormark recently uh, wrote the company up without a rating uh, in their sedimentary research uh, note and uh, Haywood also covers them out of Canada. As a reminder, we've created a new email address, rockstockchannel at rkequity.com. Please reach out to us if you'd like to see any of these research notes or any additional information about Surge. Surge Battery Metals has an active social media presence. You can find them on X at Surge Battery and also on LinkedIn. And don't forget, you can find Rodney and me on X at Rodney Hooper 13 and at Lithium Ion Bull. So with that, welcome for the first time, Graham Harris to Rockstock Channel. Please, uh, you know, let us know a little bit about yourself and your background, apart from what I've said, and uh, then Rodney will lead the questioning. Well, thanks very much, Howard. It's uh, great to be reconnected. Um, we, I reached out to you last year and told you and mentioned that I would be getting involved in a company, a new company called Surge Battery Metals and invited you to follow along. And it's nice to see that uh, we've culminated uh, the relationship back to the point where we're re-engaging and I'm uh, you know, excited to be uh, telling your viewers about, uh, this story, because as you mentioned previously, uh, my, my past has been in lithium, uh, prior to that, I was in the financial industry as uh, chairman and, um, senior directors of both Yorkton and Canaccord. So I've had many years of, uh, capital markets experience and on this side of the fence, uh, I've had, uh, multiple successes. I was a uh, founder of, uh, M2 Cobalt, which was taken over by Gervois. And then subsequent to that, I was the founder of Millennial Lithium, uh, where we developed, as you mentioned, the Fastus Grandes project in Argentina, and that was taken over by Lithium Americas. And we're hoping for a third time lucky here, 
uh, getting involved in surge battery metals, which has, uh, we think the best in class sedimentary clay deposit in uh, the United States of America, specifically in uh, Northeast Nevada. That's great. Uh, Graham, if you could, uh, will not you tell us a bit about uh, the management team and, uh, the history of how your board uh, came together. Hey, Rodney, um, as, as mentioned, uh, we, we had a successful company in operation called millennial lithium and you know, the, the beauty of that and why, I, why I wanted to get involved in another lithium project per se is, you know, I had a, a great experience working with the team and I highly respected the team and, you know, in this business, once you have and find people that uh, you enjoy working with and trust, uh, I, I really wanted to keep that team together and. It, we were fortunate to find a good project. And when I asked Ian and BJ to look at Surge Battery Metals Nevada North project, it really ticked all the boxes of, you know, something that we thought that we could grow uh, substantially and something that we could uh, to build into something uh, akin to Millennial Lithium. And it allowed us the opportunity to work together again. And when I introduced the project to Ian and BJ, uh, not only did they agree to come on board, um, but as Howard mentioned earlier, they were advisors to millennial and they've actually come on as directors. Uh, BJ's never come on the board of a company before. So that says a lot about his faith in this project. And I'm really excited to keep our, our technical team together. And the, like I said, the main guys, w we have existing people at uh, Nevada North and Surge, Alan Morris, the founding geo. Um, now we're working closely with him, with Ian. And VJ has been, uh, doing what VJ does. And just yesterday we announced the results of our network. Uh, I trust in VJ and I know he's going to get us to that promise lead of 99.99 battery grade. And, uh, off the bat, we announced, uh, our first pass of network on the flow sheet got to 99% purity, uh, technical grade. So he's doing his thing and we're very confident in this project and I'm excited to be working with you guys again. Just remind us of VJ's background. His name has been bandied about. I heard him, you know, originally from, you know, Joel Lowry in like 2015, but I think he like worked for FMC, but just like, dude, why is he such a guru? Yeah. VJ has been around for, for a number of years. He's got his teeth, uh, in this space. He's probably one of the longest tenured people in the space. VJ actually holds one of the patents, uh, for the live event, uh, project down in Argentina. Uh, there's probably not a major lithium project in the world that he hasn't consulted on. And as a matter of fact, he was actually consulting for the DOE, uh, from the, on the government side, looking at Thacker pass and, and the DOE loan in the lithium space, there's, uh, you know, very few people that have the, the breadth of knowledge that BJ has and his expertise being, you know, the guru, if you Google him, he comes up as the guru of lithium processing and that, that is VJ in a nutshell. Okay, great. And Graham, if you could, uh, will you just walk us through your milestones that you've achieved uh, last year in 23? Yeah, Rodney, 23 was uh, an exciting year for us. It's only been a year since I've been involved in this company. And since that time, we've, uh, just, uh, published our maiden resource, which came out in January. So last year we did a lot of the drilling that, uh, got us to the point where we could announce a, a maiden resource. Uh, we've done all the preliminary met work to, uh, get to the point where we have a flow sheet announce that those results yesterday. And more importantly, we're setting up now for bigger milestones this year, uh, in Nevada, there's two stages of development. We've been operating under what they call a notice of intent, which really limits us in terms of, uh, exploration, uh, because you're limited to five acre disturbance. So the really interesting thing for me was this maiden resource is literally based off drilling off the side of a road. So we limited our disturbance area and not even targeting the best geophysical targets. So, you know, we're looking forward to expanding that and to expand that we, we the next phase of development in Nevada is called the plan of operation and everything we've done last year leading into this year, uh, is, is setting up to, uh, allow us to get approval for the plan of operation, hopefully this fall. So beyond the drilling and, and everything announced this year, you'll also, what you won't see is all the uh, cultural studies, the environmental studies and all the work that has gone into preparing us to apply for the plan of operation, uh, which we're doing now. And, and hopefully we'll get that uh, approval in the fall. So lots going on behind the scenes as, as well as what in the news, news flow now. You issued a substantial uh, mineral resource estimates, uh, on the Nevada North lithium project. Um, I saw it included 
formerly intense LCE of over 3000 PPM, which is impressive. Um, can you elaborate on the, uh, mineral resource estimate and how it compares, you know, to other projects in the region? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a heck of a resource. Um, you know, Sprott has come out with a table that compares it to all the, uh, other, uh, clay deposits, uh, sedimentary based deposits in Nevada, and it stands really head and shoulders above all of the projects. It's really, there's only two projects that stand out in terms of size and grade, and that's. Thacker Pass owned by Lithium Americas and Nevada North owned by Surge. So they're, they're the two, uh, the two giants in the area. And the, you know, what's important to note is that was really one small area of the property that, you know, produced the maiden resource. And we're about to, uh, do a, a bigger drilling program this spring. And I expect, uh, a sizable increase in that resource come, come fall, uh, based on the extended drilling that we're doing, uh, over May and June here. So not only is it large, it's about to get larger and it's in the top echelon. Uh, it's really a world-class deposit and what really sets it aside apart from the size is it's the grade. The grade is three times the average of uh, sedimentary deposits. It's at Alagas to Thacker Pass, 3000 PPM is, it's extraordinary for clay deposits and, uh, we're fortunate to, uh, to have this. And I've noticed as well, that a lot of it's uh, is at or near surface as well. Yeah, that's a great point, Rodney. Um, you know, where Thacker pass, we'll, they'll be blending, um, their ore from deeper, higher grade material. Uh, most of our high grade, funny enough, is that surface. The top hundred feet is the highest grade. It's roughly around 4,000 PPM. And that's really going to positively affect the economics when we, uh, when we're working on the PEA this fall, because you'll be you'll be mining that stuff first, and that's going to go a long way to offsetting your, your, your capex higher grades that you're processing at the start is really going to improve the opex in the first uh, eight to 10 years as well. Yeah, I, I picked that up and, um, you've announced, you, you know, your first stage of metallurgical testing, um, on your clay, uh, with encouraging results to produce technical grade carbonate. What's next on that, on that front? Well, what's next is, you know, now we've, you know, proof of concept that, uh, you can produce technical grade and, and actually some of the, uh, the battery manufacturers will accept technical grade and that's what they're looking for. But, um, our, our next step is to, uh, produce the battery grade material. So now that we've identified, uh, uh, remaining elements that, uh, that exist in, in, the, in the carbonate at the technical grade, we'll work on uh, removing those impurities. And our next step now is to produce, to show that we can produce battery grade material from from our clays and we'll be uh, announcing shortly that we'll be working with Comet code to fund the next study, which will get the battery grade material. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, optimized flow sheet. Um, can you just elaborate a bit on that? Yes, we'll be working on that as well. Um, over the next, uh, you know, four or five months and incorporate that in the PEA. So part of getting the battery grade, uh, we'll, we'll send some more material to Cometco and we'll start optimizing the flow sheet as well. So at the initial stage to get to technical grade, you're just more focused on separation. And now we're going to focus on optimizing that separation. Okay. And you've got, you mentioned it earlier, you've got a PEA due out, uh, by Q4 uh, of this year. Um, can you talk about, um, you know, You've, we discussed how close the resource is to surface and what are you hoping to see in the, in the PEA in respect to, you know, OPEX and CAPEX given that? That's a good point, Rodney. And at this point, you know, we're going to be using a lot of the, you know, the base number, base study numbers that probably Lithium Americas did. So we're probably going to be probably pretty similar in terms of economics to, uh, the Thacker pass. We, we feel that. It'll, the number will be slightly better in terms of the OPEX, because as you pointed out, we'll be processing the higher grade earlier on. And we think that will impact, uh, positively on, on the PEA. So we're hoping for economics that are slightly better than, than lithium America's Thacker path deposit. And based on what we're seeing so far, we're, we're fairly confident given the grade and, um, using the same flow sheet, uh, we, we should have pretty, pretty good numbers come the fall. And, uh, I I know it's there, but if you can, you can just, you know, tell the listeners the infrastructure that's near uh, the, uh, the project, it looked to be, uh, that there's substantial infrastructure around. 
that um, North Nevada project? Yeah, fortunately, we are in Nevada. It's the number one mining jurisdiction in, in America. Um, we do have great infrastructure. Nevada is a mining state. Uh, there's many operation, mining operations. We're fortunate to be close to a town, Elko, uh, which is home to, you know, we have Anglo, we have uh, Barrick. So we have a lot of um, equipment, drillers, geologists, storage facilities. Uh, we are literally 30 miles from Elko down a main highway, then 10 miles off a dirt road, probably about eight miles as the crow flies to uh, power. So great infrastructure in, in the area. And uh, while we're on that, I know it's highly rated, but sometimes these things, when you start to operate, they're different from um, the advertising on the box operating in Nevada. Have you found it to be, um, to live up to its, its rating and, and how is it, how has it been to interact with, with government and landowners and so on? I would say it's been uh, as advertised. Um, and, and that's good and bad because as advertised, um, you know, it's pretty straightforward the process, uh, that we go through for permitting. Uh, but on the flip side, it's, uh, it's a it's a process and, you know, we would just come out of the COVID area where, you know, a year ago or two years ago, you phone up and go to the office and nobody would be there and you get, you get your delays. So it's not like it's been, uh, this super efficient, but it is, it is a well-defined process and you just have to to tick the boxes and go along with it and just these things take, take time. Would I like it to be quicker? Absolutely. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a straightforward process and we are looking forward to getting our approvals. Um, and as far as the plan of operation, which is our next step, you know, we've ticked all the boxes. It's a, uh, it's an application that you just have to follow through and we haven't had any impediments so far. So it's, it's a good process. It's just an old slow process. And Hopefully someday, somewhere along the way, um, you know, so these things will, will, will speed up, but for now they're, they are what they are and, uh, what, what it is, it, it, it's nice to know that it's just clear cut. And as long as you do what you're supposed to do, you'll, you'll get there in the end. And, and that's a very, that's a positive. Right. And, uh, typically clay projects, you know, with what we've seen with lack have meaningful cap capex budgets, um, is the plan to follow in their footsteps, potentially with, you know, DOE funding, a downstream partner, you know, anything on your thoughts on, on how to fund, fund a project of this size. Yeah, that's a great question, Rodney. And you know, it is a large capex. So we, we do plan to access this, go the same route and, and look for that funding. Um, you know, that's going to greatly enhance the economics. We can get, we can get funding at uh, T bill rates for 80% of your projects. So it's. It's a key, um, it's a key, uh, financial instrument and, you know, barring any, you know, one of the things we, we will investigate in, in the next year also is some of the DLE technologies that have, uh, that have come out that may work, uh, for clays. You know, we've been in discussions with a couple of companies and that might, uh, greatly enhance the, uh, the CapEx and OpEx, but it's, it's still early days for that. But, uh, being, you know, second in line and not the pioneer getting the arrows in the back, like the theme Americas. We, uh, you know, we have access to, uh, a couple other new ideas that, uh, that may help, but I, I can't say for sure at this point in time that those will come to fruition. So worst case scenario, you, you're, you're basing yourself on the Thacker pass model and the DOE funding. And, uh, we're confident that this project will be, uh, you know, the FPV and the economics will hold, will hold quite well. And if, uh, we can add any new technology or any, any new exciting, uh, ways to, uh, you know, cut this, uh, cut this cake and, and maybe add some, you know, extraction technologies that'll re you know, reduce the OPEX when that's just going to be uh gravy. And, uh, you plan to do some, uh, spring and summer expansion drilling, you know, and you announced an agreement with the private surface landholders is the objective to increase the resource further before, um, targeting the maximization of the reserve inventory. What? What's the sort of size that you'd like to get to on, on total resource first, perhaps? Yeah, I, I think we're already there, Ronnie, in terms of size, 5 million tons, you know, 50,000 tons a year is a hundred year by life. So we have size, what we're looking for is just, uh, maybe, um, test the grades in, in that area, 
Uh, we're fortunate um, to have come to an agreement with Salmon River. And what that, that's going to allow us to do is tie in the southern uh, end of the property where we had great soil samples as well. So we'll be able to maximize and, and really like look at all the geophysics and maximize the uh, the grades, which we haven't been able to do. We've come up with a large resource based on drilling off the side of a road. So we really want to firm it up when we get to that point of, um, you know, M and A or M and I and uh, reserve category and, and really target the best areas on the property. And we haven't been able to do that yet, but this will allow us to get there. So remind me, I, I saw some eye-watering grades. I thought I, I read there potentially. But the, the hole next to the, the private lands was our best hole. And that had, uh, I believe up to 7,000 PPM uh, so in, in, in the sand plate. Yeah. yeah. And that was that's right on the border, so. I thought I read even eight, but yes, that's, that's impressive. It was, yeah, there was one section of eight. I didn't want to get too aggressive, but you know, the, the main <laughs> section, we had a very strong, uh, strong interval at 7,000 BPM. And, and that's interesting because it's not just a, a sample at 7,000 BPM. We have a strong 20, 30, 40 meters of, uh, you know, over 5,000 plus BPM and a number of, uh, the holes near that, um, near that Southern extent. So we're, we're excited to be drilling that that way as well and uh you can expect if you just look at the the footprint of the drilling uh if it holds and the geophysics says it should hold uh you're, you're going to look for a sizable increase in the resource um, after we drill the spring and uh you also mentioned drilling on the uh, m3 jv project can you talk a bit about that one what what's the what do the prospects look like there yeah, that's going to be interesting. We noticed that the, uh, the deposit is dipping west, uh, and north, um, a lot of it's at surface and then we have it slightly dipping to the west. So it'll be interesting to see because we don't pick it up on the geophysics, uh, on that ground, but it, it'll be interesting to test the theory that it's, uh, to drill a little deeper there and just test the, uh, the Western extent and see if it is dipping down. It's still, and still there apart from the strategic importance of that ground is blocking other people in the area and allowing us, um, you know, increased, uh, you know, a increased acreage for, you know, even buildings or, you know, we only had 4,000 acres until I joined and now we have 12,000 acres. So it's really expanding the footprint and making sure that, uh, we don't box ourselves in and, and that gives us enough area to, uh, you know, have infrastructure. So even if it's benign ground, it's still valuable ground, but, uh, it'll be interesting to test because theoretically it's, it's dipping and it should be there. And, and one thing that, uh, increasingly is becoming important is, um, you know, ESG, uh, can you highlight mm -hmm. for the listeners, what ESG work you've, you've initiated? Yeah. And that's a, that's another great question, Rodney, because it is, is a highlight and you know, not being a pioneer in this business, it helped me down in, uh, Argentina, you know, watching all the mistakes that all the rows made, uh, or a Cobra made at all the rows, um, allowed us to, uh, you know, change some of our tactics that passed us grand days. And the same thing is happening here in Nevada where, you know, part of Lithium America's, uh, main, main issues were cultural and, uh, you know, we got engaged right away. We noticed that we didn't want those hurdles uh, facing us and we recognized that they would be hurdles that we didn't tackle them head on. So initially, uh, last year we engaged the same cultural studies, uh, peoples and advisors that Lithium Americas did. So we've been undergoing doing, doing our cultural work and that's dealing with all the indigenous, the, what, what they call down there, the, all the tribes, the tribal communities, uh, we've been actively engaging with them. Uh, we don't have any nearby, uh, but there are. There is one tribe that's in that area of influence that we do need to consult with, but we we are consulting with all the uh, tribal uh, nations in the area and also environmental. Uh, we've been very uh, diligent, again, hiring the same people that Lithium Americas used to do all our environmental studies. So we've been actively engaging and reaching out uh, and addressing uh, local concerns. Uh, we Another one is the Salmon River, who are our neighbors. We have other ranchers in the area. We've been reaching out to them as well, recognizing that we need to be good stewards in the community. We've been, we've been actively, uh, reaching out to all the, uh, stakeholders. Excellent. And, uh, you have some cash on hand and I see there's some warrants and options outstanding considering these and, and possible conversion. When is it that you're likely, you know, how much, how long will that cash last? When will you likely need additional funding? 
Yeah, that cash for our budget shows that that cash lasts till the end of this year. Um, so we're fully funded for this year's operations. Where we're going to need capital in the future is on the plan approval of the plan of operation. Because the plan of operation, that's when we go from five acre disturbance under the notice of intent to 250 acres of disturbance under the plan of operation. And that's going to mean, you know, a very uh, aggressive, much bigger drilling program. We're looking at 60 to 80 holes under the plan of operation. That's going to be expensive. We'll be doing the engineering work for the bankable feasibility. That's going to be expensive. We'll be doing the pilot plan. That's going to be expensive. So all said and told, uh, you know, our budget looking past this year is a further 20 to 25 million. And we will be looking to fund that phase of development based on this year's success. We do have the uh, opportunity to approach um, our strategic uh, investor, American Lithium, who owns 10% of the company, uh, to exercise their warrant. That would bring in another seven, eight million dollars. So um, we, we have options to help us get to that 20 million. There are a number of people circling that uh, now that we've come out with some results and information, it's starting to uh, to get noticed out there. And I, I, I fully expect that we'll get some kind of strategic investment on top of, uh, American lithium's involvement. If you were to pinpoint the key milestones for this year that you think, you know, investors should be interested in as, you know, catalysts for the, for the share price in your mind. Rodney, I could come out with a golden wand and nobody's going to care. What I, what we need is the lithium market and sentiment in the lithium space to turn. You know, we've come out with as much good news as I can manufacture. Um, it's really a question right now when I, when I talk to people is what we're setting this company up for, because we've come up with great news and we have more great news to follow is that when the sentiment turns and people are looking to reinvest in the lithium space, uh, we will have risen uh, as the cream of the crop and people will, will look to, uh, surge battery metals to be, you know, a, a choice to invest in it if you want to play in the lithium space. So. We have all of catalysts coming up. We just did the, the met work. We've got further drilling. So you have a big expansion on the resource probably coming in the fall, the PEA, and then hopefully, uh, the plan of operation approval. And those are some pretty big milestones and hopefully, uh, you know, we, we de-risk this thing to the point that, uh, people will realize that this, uh, this company is going to be worth a lot more as we, as we keep going. You've been very good at advancing projects as, uh, the millennial lithium had a definitive feasibility study and lithium Americas has taken it over and they've reworked that definitive feasibility study since then, uh, a bit and Ganfeng just took a 15% stake for $70 million valuing that project actually slightly above what, uh, they paid you for it. But, uh, so there's, there's lots of between here and actually going into production. When I think about it, I got my start with the Thacker Pass project as in lithium. I've been doing lithium 15 years, the first seven, that was the only project, you know, mm -hmm. that I focused on. And I was just trying to think of like, you don't have 15 years ahead of you. Hopefully, uh, it, you know, the market is much more, much bigger and, and known and, and we talk about second mover advantage in, um, in lithium rather than first mover advantage. So you, you mentioned certain things along the way that you've learned from, but when I think about lithium, the Thacker pass project, you know, it was 2018, I think they put out their feasibility study or a new feasibility study, which was owned by, you know, lithium Americas. And then there was like two or three years worth of permitting contest there that hopefully you can shave. But if I think about it from 2018 to 26 years now, uh, and if you, if you didn't have the COVID and, and, you know, if you could shave that two to three years off and you also have, you know, the proof of concept, you know, the ZOE is going to loan GM, you know, made a big investment. So all of that knowledge you can rest upon. So that hopefully the, the, the time frame is more condensed, but it, it, it it's not necessarily you who are going to, you know, be developing this, you know, in four or five years, again, there's a lot of value that could be created from this 50 million market value to maybe it's a better feasibility study, or maybe, you know, some of the bigger players, once Thacker passes production and it's proven, they say, okay, thank you very much for taking, you know, doing this and, and a Rio Tinto or someone else, you know, who knows, um, comes in and, and, and takes it over. Anyway, those are just some thoughts. 
going back to my history with Clay and my history with you, Graham, uh, that I think our listeners uh, may find relevant. Um, thank you very much for this uh, introduction, uh, Graham, to, uh, you know, and being among the first on our Getting to Know You series. And uh, we look forward to monitoring your progress and uh, having you on later this year uh, once you hit some additional milestones and, and hopefully the backdrop of lithium prices will be a bit higher at your, as will your valuation. But uh, fingers crossed. I don't have my crystal ball, but uh, thanks again very much, Graham, and we'll see you soon. Okay. Thank you guys. Appreciate it.